Thanks for that really nice introduction, Colin. I nearly brought my guitar. <laughs> my new guitar. My baby. I bought a tailor. Oh, it's so wonderful. Flowering. The night we parted, my drink caught on fire. News of your betrayal lit the blackness. Before long, the whole garden exploded. My roses were the first to go, thorns popping and smelling like a witch hunt. I stood beneath the fallout, letting the snaking cinder sting my arms. This was catharsis. To rid myself of jealousy, your control. Flowering is never predictable. These small deaths have nothing to do with the heart. So um, that poem pretty much describes uh, the last few relationships I've been in. Um, yeah, it was it was interesting this morning um, looking over recent publications and making a selection for the reading tonight. Um, the writing in my last major collection from Brick, uh, which is my third book, uh, Your Last Day on Earth, it it seems oddly prescient, and it makes one wonder. Are we living what we're writing, or are we writing what we're about to live? Stolen Torch. Look how this maple in front of my house drops a brooding leaf every few seconds until there are rings of fallen stars orbiting the driveway. I count them methodically as they spindle the dwarf tree's arthritic hands, each one transformed and torching the steps. There's abuse, too, along the fence behind my son's school. Leaves splattered against that wire mesh screen, like photos secreted from a police file. I say, I'm sure he did it, no question. As a charming pyromaniac bends every tree branch back, fire courses down, the trees giving up their masks, their armor. This is who they're supposed to be, Prometheus, performance artist, finally set free. So I had the privilege of reading with Stephen Hyten on a number of occasions, and uh, we did a literary festival in Montreal a few years ago and subsequent ones, and I noticed that Stephen never ever read from anything unless he was, it was in print. And I, I asked him about that, and he said, he said, well, that's just what I feel comfortable with. So I decided to do almost the same thing. And as uh, my my present manuscript is developing, I was looking this morning at, at the journals that I've been publishing in, and so I brought some of them. So this poem uh, was just published in the fall issue of uh, Event, and a couple of years ago I got obsessed, and I'm still kind of there, with the poetry of uh, Marjorie Pickthall. And I, I moved to Kingston, I spent two years in archives uh, reading her letters and papers and, and those that knew her. So a number of the poems in the new manuscript have uh, epigraphs from her work. This poem is titled Heart Wall. Hard in the frost and the snow, the cedar must have known in his red, deep, vibrant heart a hundred winters ago, I should love and carve you so. And that's from Pickthall's The Woodcarver's Wife, which was one of her big poems. Before the age of five, I have no memory, but I'm told my heart was made of clay. It was a sturdy vessel, could hold water, not blood. 
When it tried to swell with wonder or love, little cracks would open in the heart wall and ventricles. There was no point to this heart, so I gave in and allowed the floodwaters in my body to wash it out. Then I woke one morning in a pool of mud. At six, I was grateful for my first memory, for the smell of sand and rain in my hair. Nothing happened for a while until I kissed a boy at 13. I saw my heart return, its sparkling pathways mapped through a curved glass dome. When the boy broke up with me, my heart wall banged in amazement at his lies, my innocence. Too soon, the splintered glass found its mark. Unlike before, I woke in a pool of light, safe again without a heart to smash. The older I got, the more new lovers claimed I stood aloft. They used words to describe me, like seductive and taunting. Their glass or clay hearts, born of my cast-offs, kept me blindsided, incensed. So I decided to smash theirs, and I smashed quite a few, not believing what happened when mine grew back new. I covered gray distances with that shell of self, until I flew so high I crashed. Months passed. I knew it would hurt, but I opened my ribcage to a heart of wood. Overnight the heart wall branched, and my numbing feet descended deep into earth. Was I trying to petrify, become immortal? Today I am offering up my heart of wood. It is ready for chopping and grinding. My lover's fine grip around the supple veined kindling. His blade is impatient, desires that we sharpen our dance for the blaze to come along my heart wall's arbor. Hangs fire. <laughs> So while in Kingston, I, um, besides working on Pickthall, I also met uh, Bruce Kaufman. I'm sure many of you know him, and um, he's a fine editor. And uh, this anthology, that's not forgotten, uh, uh, from Kingston poets and about the shores around Kingston, was published in 2012. And um, this next poem. Also, uh, uh, telling my relationship woes. <laughs> um, it has another um, epigraph from Pickthall. When the last moon burns low, and spark by spark, the little worlds die out along the dark. And this is titled Milk. I'm filling up with clouds. You have inside yourself, in case that high moon in a starless western window. Silence has loved me through many lifetimes. Multiple anxieties over what kind of relationship waits upon your locked doorstep. There's no such thing as emotional logic. The phone rings, an email pops in. Your latch snaps and spark by spark, my tears burst over porcelain stung cheeks. Breakup scenario 549, we take our unfathomable world into ourselves and down it like frothing milk. My lips untouched for days, press and search for more transmutable energy. For too long I floated between room dividers. Sometimes they are elegant, silvery, clear drapes of longing. Sometimes they are hung so weakly Little holes start opening, dying out like Pickthall's whirls, and moths flutter and chew, cause arrhythmia, screw up our hearts. Can anyone second guess addictive love, manic and angry, straight like a bullet's murderous thought? More room dividers, installed like pacemakers, charged up with sex, setting off alarms inside and between our bodies. We fly towards that last moon, transfigured by a quest for calm, authenticity. It balloons and ignites, luminous rice paper, burnt and burning. You skim my hot skin, breathing more little worlds to replace those collapsing.
So um, I'm going to read now from The River. It's a long sequence poem. And um, Jenna was just here uh, featuring a tree. Unfortunately, I was in Toronto doing my recording. Um, this uh, poem is actually about the, the man that I got involved with. It broke up my marriage. And it's partly about that, but the, the larger uh, the thing is that uh, I went to see a, a film about Philip Glass, and and it was a documentary, and it just had tremendous meaning for me. And I've played uh, a lot of Philip Glass and admire him as a composer. And he talked about the river of creativity uh, burbling under his his cottage in Nova Scotia every morning, and that's what uh, actually got him out of bed and and that's just had you know tremendous uh, a meaning for me and I also thought when I was reading through it today that um, that only a truly classical music nerd can can use uh, musical terms and make them sound sexy which is <laughs> which is what happens um, and it starts with an epigraph from Winnie the Pooh Sometimes if you stand on the bottom rail of a bridge and lean over to watch the river slipping slowly away beneath you, you will suddenly know everything there is to be known. So this poem is, it's so intertwined. Um, I'm just going to read uh, a part that really is about the heart. And that's another part of the selection for this evening and in my new collection, Heartbreak. Passion is ephemeral, housing a pathological heart. When the river speaks, the lover will lift the muse off his bed, her lithe body pulsing as music pulses, vibrating psychically and spiritually between them. She has been trying not to notice the other constant and off-key cross-current so close to the river's surface she keeps doubling back. The cross-current sings an indiscernible melody, confusing, void of meter. It is this other, discordant song trying to kill passion, tempting the muse to turn away, but she holds fast to the lover, wondering if he will tire of her wavering and lack of attention to the mutual side of desire. One day he will ask, how much longing can you hide inside yourself before frustration bursts forth, breaking the levee, protecting our hearts? In a sense, the levee can never help us. Damming up what needs to be felt and heard results in constant unnatural eruptions. When she listens to Philip Glass, his music tells her to walk towards pain and reach right in, cupping its essence like gold, seeds, beauty, orgasm. The muse wants that burbling of the river to nudge her towards sustained happiness. Glass is always there, transcribing notes and light into her lines and migrating keys. His pain walks in and out, spraying droplets from the river. They are over her head, prismatic sound. Not even a gully washer of off-colored notes could destroy her entirely. She feels passion in that arc, honesty housed in ruinous pleasure. Trust is the raw score of the muse's desire. Trust burns openly, then submerges itself until the other's voice spins inside her most carnal thoughts. The other says she will never find fulfillment with the lover. These tones escape and lead with an unheard thud on the river's sandy bottom. The escape tones trawl her dreams, infecting otherwise clear streams, and she finds herself awakened more often by an unearthly expansion of feeling. The scars of trust are shiny and deep, emotional formatas of undetermined length. The pleasures of the heart 
are the pleasures of the mind. The palate must be filled with light and carnality. The lower the lover introduces carnality like a Schoenberg tone row, 12 oysters on the half shell arranged chromatically. Once they are shucked, little pieces of grit cling like melodic fragments. The lover will claim her succulent full saying in iridescent tones the deep plunge of oyster brine hitting his tongue. She is still shy and high from champagne, the slippery sea salt sweetness opening the muse further. When her river bursts forth over the landscape of his face, the air rises about them in tumultuous harmonies. The muse has been handed a deceptive cadence, so wise and lilting, neither can escape the enlightened den. Chromaticism sated. She can now share her sorrowful ecstasy, its rhythmic essence, with the world. The lover fills oyster shells with tea candles. They burn and burn, engorged with music. So I'm going to read uh, one poem from LRC. It's a great, it's mostly a review, a review but they do publish some poets. Uh, this is called uh, Forbidden Fruit. You claim to be the knife, so I change into an apple. All night you peel and peel. Top layer gone, you see my second skin, grainy and raw, blushed, tart. The first slice is juicy, breaks in your mouth like a wound. A salt spit burning sweet and warm. I am not Eve, but you have been every woman's Adam. You say this doesn't matter, then take another slice, then another. I turn in bed, cadenced by your expert carving, a tornado-like zigzag dropping on rough-hewn floors, turning up questions of right and wrong. Some myth sayers tell this story with a tomato, others a pomegranate. Because I'm not Eve, I don't mind being the apple, throwing polished seeds onto a freezing, resistant landscape, but not so cold my skin won't oxidize. Look where your lips have branded my fresh shorn nakedness, every welt darkening into sticky, indelible bruises. I could have forbidden you to come near me again, but can't bear flowering without the bitter cut of cross-pollination. So I'm going to read um, a couple of short new poems. And uh, that last poem referenced landscape, and I've got um, several of these landscape poems dotting the new manuscript, and they have sort of different titles like landscape angiogram, uh, landscape uh, never. That one is about my mother dropping me on my head when I was three months old, and I'm lucky to be alive. Um, this one's called uh, Landscape Saturn. And begins with an epigraph from David McGimsey. Once the snow was so deep, you almost couldn't hear Margaret Atwood. <laughs> I love David. <laughs> White blinding sun. Even with movie star shades set firmly on my nose, feet and hands disappear in a mirage of patio umbrellas. Heat is more aggressive than snow, cannibalistic. I could eat a pound of snow, never quote an Atwood line, still certain to hear her in summer over the raucous backhoes. Three days ago, my cardiologist told me I had broken heart syndrome, or more accurately, takosubo, the Japanese name for octopus traps. Like Jan Arden, the left side of my heart had ballooned, leaving the base intact but gasping beneath the fluid-filled weight of a newly sprung head foot. I say, unbreak me, 
While my heart crackles like lightning across the snow-capped screen, the doctor says, don't move, and I am back on that scorched patio, sunglasses intact. Slippery as ice, today's special calamari steaks swings by. Edible women, my ticker is a tantric bomb on that plate, arteries sparkling clear, not rainbowed like Saturn's rings. I always knew something terrible would jangle loose if I let my heart gallop out of sight. Plain wild. And so recently I've been privileged to join a, a writing group here in Ottawa called the Ruby Tuesdays. And uh, several, <laughs> several of you are here tonight. Thank you. And um, this poem references some of what I was talking about a little bit before, um, a difficult relationship, which turned really ugly. And uh, this poem came out in a writing exercise uh, with a line that was given that several of the rubies used uh, too much light can kill. It came out as a, as a sonnet. And it's titled Scars. Too much light can kill. After the assault, my will faltered, rode to hell in a handbasket of shame. No matter how many friends said, you are not to blame, a perpetual line of attackers appeared, starting with my mother. While the blows came faster and faster, there's not enough of me left over to stand in scarred afterlight, burning up with others who share my plight. So I hover in the dusk, feel shadows still, shoving truant trust atop my windowsill of memory. Yeah, and so I'm not going to end on a dark note. I'm going to read one more poem from uh, Your Last Day on Earth, and it's called Karma. My past lives are waiting on hangers to be reborn. Victorian morning clothes with antique buttons, raw hide vests pasted with steel magnolias. When I open the closet, they huddle together, trying to block me from reading their auras. I hear whispers as I fly past the rayon and linen, silk and denim. I meet fashioned rejects dancing with see-through nightgowns, the modest, tattooed, pierced, and cloned. I'm stunned by the clash of colors, by the whorish banging of velvet against polyester. And the shoes, please, can we talk? Leathery veilings of erotic toe cleavage. Why are these rags crushed and crushing my closet? There are so many lessons they haven't learned yet. In their next incarnation, I'm sure they'll wake deified in a resale bin, blessed by the cone-shaped wonder bra Madonna saw the light in. Thank you.